Oh my god. Hey y'all, Boogie Night here. How's it going? And uh, buckle up because this review is gonna be a doozy. I have seen a ton of movies in my time. And I'm not saying that to brag about my incredible movie resume or whatever you want to call it. I just want to illustrate the fact that I will give any movie genre a go. And I've seen everything from the creme de la creme to the crap at the bottom of the grease trap at the local Bojangles. It doesn't matter to me. And something else longtime viewers and friends know about me is a lot of my movie tastes pretty much borderline on the weird slash awesomely bad slash borderline trash. I mean, I have love Godfrey Ho movies. I've seen Robot Jocks, Space Truckers, Jupiter Ascending. I own a copy of None of Monza for crying out loud. That ought to tell you about the kind of movies I'm interested in seeing, at least once or twice, or in some cases multiple, more than that. Um, but up until this point, I've always considered the most trashy slash irredeemable movie to date was Monkey King with 72 Magic. And if you haven't seen my review of it, I will put a link to that in the description below. But then a couple of nights ago, well, Monkey King with 72 Magic is off that list because Mordegas and I were subjected to a movie called Birdemic, Shock and Terror. Let that sink in for a hot second. Now, Birdemic, Shock and Terror, or I'm just going to call it Birdemic at this point, was something that's been on my radar, no pun intended, for pretty much almost two years. Um, my dear, dear friend Barry Grave and I were swapping bad movie ideas when we were still getting to know each other, and she brought up this number. And I said, you know what? Sure, why not? I'll give it a go. And finally got around to seeing it. So, to say that I was warned that was pretty much emanated a thousand volt. I wasn't going in blissfully blind thing, but I didn't know just how bad and irredeemable this movie was. Um, Birdemic um, was a 2008 release by James Nguyen, um, listed as a romantic horror movie. So in short, it was a, it was a Titanic uh, exploitation film. No, I'm kidding. Um, and. Morgues and I pretty much had several thoughts right out of the gate, and I'm going to try and go into as much detail as possible about why it was so bad. First we thought it was a student project because of how bad it was. Then I realized I've seen student projects that were so much better than this movie. My senior project in college, which dealt with mostly still frames, was still better than Birdemic. Um, then we thought you know what, this, this just could be a spoof movie, this just could be a pretty much good rip-off movie like um, Toxic Avenger, or Mega Shark vs. Crocosaurus, or Sharknado, or The Troca, and um, The Asylum films. This is a movie I don't think even The Asylum or Troca would ever be considered picking up. This is a movie that I think Andreas Schnoss, who is the director of violent shit, probably would just thumb his nose at. That's just kind of how bad Birdemic it actually is. I don't think I could see this again, and no amount of alcohol can ever fix that. And I've seen Sallow and Caligula for crying out loud. I think I would rather watch Monkey King with 72 Magic again, just because I could, at least with that, I can extrapolate, and there were some things we can make fun of. This one was just us pointing out errors left and right, from the start to the finish and everything in between. Anyway, so let's just get the plot in a nutshell out of the way. I'm saying in a nutshell because I'm still kind of trying to figure out all this because there was so much crap flying around throughout the movie plot-wise that we might as well have been watching a documentary on how to empty porta potties. That's kind of where it comes from. It jumps from a bad romance, kind of like something you would see in Rules of Attraction, which I'm not knocking Rules of Attraction, I'm just kind of analyzing how it was kind of a slipshod romance in a lot of areas, and you're just like, wow, that really did happen. To actual romance, to drama, and then all of a sudden it flips to um, horror, using the term very loosely, to action, to horror, to drama again, 
without just any warning or anything like that. It Godfrey home movies jump around plot wise, but once again, at least those somehow tie into it. I mean, it starts with a guy named Rod, and yes, I mean, and of course, Morgas and I were making you know Borat jokes. And that, there's another movie that was better than this was Borat. I mean, where it was like my Rod, you know, or anything like that. He's some sort of software engineer, salesperson dude who pretty much meets this one woman and he borderline stalks her to get her phone number and their first date was this pretty much you know something that I would wait till like six months and be like you know do you want to have kids you know who's the right man in your life I think I could be the right man I think it could be the right woman well what are you looking for in a woman it's, it's like something I would do back in middle school be like uh, so, hey, you going to the 8th grade dance? Actually, you know, I think when I asked uh, Becky A to the 8th grade dance, I had more class and charm than that. And I've got no charm whatsoever. So, it turns into a blooming relationship. They eventually consummate, and we're going to talk about sound effects later on. And then it turns into a bastardized version of Alfred Hitchcock's the birds. But in the worst possible way. I mean, it wasn't even like it was horrific. It was like kamikaze birds are just killing everybody at once. Mm-hmm. And somehow everybody's dead except for Rod and his lady friend and two other people who get instantly killed by the birds. Nothing's left. They meet, find two kids that they rescue, so when they go from just starting out the relationship to having an instant family, who would have thought? And then they try to escape from the attacking birds. They run into the woods. They meet up with a mountain man who lives in a treehouse who says the reason about this is because the birds can sense that humans are killing off the world and that's why they're hating on industrialism, and that's why Mr. Hippie living in the treehouse is safe. So then it turns into the happening, combined with an inconvenient truth, and somehow in there it turned into 28 days later, since they were the last humans left alive, it seemed. And this wasn't even explained about if this was happening all over the country, or just in this weird little like, California town which to me was like almost tr as trashy as like the Florida Panhandle and like Redneck Central up yonder. So this whole time, these kamikaze birds are attacking randomly because they were sick and tired of people polluting it and Mother Nature just had a stroke and said, you know what, screw it, Let, let's, let's go for it. And these things are so interspersed back and forth in such a twisted way. You're just thinking, how does that relate to that? How does this relate to this? How did this all of a sudden come into play? I mean, when, when the happening thing came on board, I, Morges and I were like, hot dogs are good. Are you eyeing my lemon drink? Or anything like that. I mean, we had to kind of keep our minds straight. And, oh, so that's the kind of the nutshell thing. Um, of the plot wise so with that out of the way let's talk about the camera angles let's talk about the cinematography because this needs to go be talked about at length this was not even a high school project level cinematography from the color scheme to the angles to the monitoring it was like cut here cut here cut here cut down here cut up here the camera filters would change colors at random intervals, so it was like you're watching a 70s exploitation film to a 2000 era movie, because it would just go from very blurry and very kind of blue scale, gray scale, um, to something with a little more clarity, to maybe like kind of the angle, you're, the color scheme you're seeing on me. You could record this movie on a camera phone, on a, on a galaxy or an or a, an iPhone and it would still be a better quality 
there were times when Rod and his girlfriend were talking and the camera would just randomly kind of just pan away and then pan. It was like the camera person was falling asleep. And then it would cut from them, you know, in the car. It would cut to them standing outside random without any kind of transition. And there was no fade away or no kind of just way to transition. It was flash cut, flash cut, flash cut. Occasionally it would do a side wipe. Like it was a freaking PowerPoint presentation. It, it still was, it was horrible to even parse. And maybe I'm just treating this a little more harshly because I majored in communications with a focus on public relations and media. So I took the courses and I understand now, maybe they just didn't have the editing software. In fact, I will go on a limb and say they didn't. But it was, you could have taken a Betamax tape, rocked the reels back and forth, you know, for a certain amount of the uh, frames per second, cut it, you know, turn to the next one, splice it. It would take longer, but there still would be a smoother transition in the editing. I've rocked the reels, and it's not too difficult if you know where everything is. If you had a basic uh, movie editing software, like, I'm not saying you need to go into using Avid or Final Cut or anything like that, but using some, you, you could probably do a better job in OBS than using the same editing software they had. And couple that with, you know, the lighting, with the camera angles, with the color scheme. And the color scheme almost in itself was just like this permanent blue tinge. It reminded me of I was watching CSI New York. It just, ugh. It was, it was cringy. It was just made me want to kind of peel the skin off my arms. And speaking of cringy, let's talk about the characters, all right? The characters, it was like they were extras from a Z movie union that needed to hit their quota. So they pulled, so James Nguyen pulled out a shepherd's crook, said, you, 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 and you. Yeah, we're gonna use you for this. I don't have a script, so just go ahead and here's kind of the basic overview and ad lib from there. And once again, I've seen trashy movies with you know characters that might the scripts might as well have been ad lib, but at least it could turn into something like whose line is this anyway? And they can build off each other. Actors before, actors and actresses before a movie, they need a chance to rehearse. They need a chance to act out these scenes. I don't think they rehearsed the scenes even once because of not just their dialogue, but how they interacted with each other. It would be like if I was meeting somebody for the very first time, particularly if it was an attractive woman, I would be flustered, but I still think I could you know, stumble a few words out of my mouth to be kind of like, okay, you know. I have a two-digit IQ. This will work. I'm pretty sure that they might have been taking something where it was a little dirk, 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 or a little... Or, you know, maybe even a little... Because I feel like it was just such a disconnect. It was There was no chemistry between the two, even when they were actually getting romantically involved, when they were, you know, holding hands, or, God forbid, the uh, horrible sex scene that happened and made me want to throw a drink in my eyes. It just all seemed very passive and very kind of like, okay, I guess. I mean, even the sex scenes in the room were better orchestrated between the, two, between the characters. And with that being said, let's talk about the dialogue between the characters. And I'm not just talking about Rod and his girlfriend, because that was just, you know, made me want to just, you know, rip the skin off my face with a butter knife. There is a scene, and I kid you not, where Rod and one of the other guy characters are talking about dropping deuces. There is one line when Rod's like, where's your girlfriend, the other guy, I, whose name I completely forget. He literally goes, she's taking a shit. I'm watching out for her. And they spend the next at least a minute or two talking about the importance of taking a shit. As if, you know, that had everything to do with running from kamikaze psychotic birds you know like maybe it was just because they were nervous but I can think of better things to talk about other than you know the last time I had a BM particularly with a guy I just met you know, 30 minutes prior yeah mm -hmm, exactly it was so non sequitur but not even to the point it was redeemable even Monkey King with 72 magic and that took a lot of effort to try and translate because the subtitles at the bottom were so grainy and 
pretty much, okay, this is the screen at Monkey King. You had maybe about this much of dialogue, of subtitles, so you had to try and tra kind of extrapolate and fill in the blanks. At least that made some sort of sense. Or Godfrey Home movies make some sort of sense. Or none of Monson makes sort of any kind of sense. Caligula made more sense dialogue-wise than this movie. I mean, you know, there, there's a scene with the hippie guy, and he's like, You live in a treehouse? Mm-hmm. Can I see it? Well, those birds don't want to hunt me because I live off the land. Huh? It was complete whiplash. It was just so horrible. Oh. And with that being said, also, the final thing I want to talk about before winding down this review is the special effects or lack thereof. A lot of people know I'm, I'm not a stickler for CGI, but I definitely am more critical if CGI is not, not really lazily done, but there's obviously not amount of, a decent amount of effort put into it when I'm talk, when doing CGI. Like Warcraft. Mm hmm. Or, um, not gonna try and raise any hackles over this, but I, I thought that Peter Cushing CGI in Rogue One could have been a little better done, or maybe they could have found an actor to replace him like they did with uh, Mon Mothma. You know, little things like that that make it kind of make me go, that could have been rendered a little bit better. But in Birdemic, the CGI effects were just awful like not even cartoony bad just horribly rendered there is a scene when the characters have automatic gun have like automatic guns and semi-automatic pistols and they're shooting at wildly at these birds and if i'm pointing a gun straight ahead and i'm pulling the trigger the muzzle flash was over here and the sound effects were over here so it's like somebody had i forget what that there's a certain microphone type that's meant for multiple people to kind of go around and talk to for like kind of multiple concepts. It's it's not like somebody had a boom mic or they were mic'd up or anything like that. It was just all over the place. Once again, not even in a funny way you go. <laughs> it was just bad. And all the sound effects were on repeat when the birds were screaming, these kamikaze eagle things, and they weren't even eagle noises. They were hawks. It was that stereotypical. Ew! You know, noise you hear in so many video games or um, the opening to Kings and Queens by 30 Seconds to Mars of um, the music video. Or the, the horrible, horrible, horrible sex scene between Rod and his girlfriend. It was basically just the sound of them like wet smooching going on for a solid minute on a loop. I mean, you could hear, it was like you know, smooch, 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 smooch for like 10, 15 seconds. One second break without them parting for air. Like, they're still going at it. And then the cycle repeats. Did they really, were the, was, they, was the couple so uninterested in each other that they had to fake it? Like, they had to smooch off camera, like, noise-wise just to kind of get the effect? And then the audio editor just, he's like, eh, no, you know what, mm -mm. <laughs> we're just going to put this on loop. That kind of thing. But the biggest thing that drove me up the freaking wall was the animation for the birds themselves. You had two different instances of the birds. The, the, the ones where the birds were just kind of doing their thing and hanging out like on windowsills or like on the ground or whatnot, it was a lazily done CGI effect. When the birds were attacking, using this term very loosely, the birds were like, you, the people were screaming and trying to point, you know, shoot at the birds wildly. The birds were hovering this far away. They were still flapping their wings and screaming, but the birds were visibly, physically so far away. I mean, I could have sucker punched one without getting attacked in return. But the way they were positioned was like seeing some of the enemies from the uh, first person horror adventure game Cursed. And if you're unfamiliar with how the design was done for Cursed, um, I will actually put a link in the description below to CJU Games and a playthrough of maybe one or two parts of his playthrough of Cursed. Just so you can see about what it's like when an enemy actually attacks 
that was better done than the birds. It, literally, it was unbelievable. I, I literally, just I couldn't believe it. And then the birds are still flying and screeching and being 10 feet away from the characters. But the characters were still shooting wildly at these birds and hitting nothing. Like, they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Something could have should have died along the way. And even when the other humans did get killed by the birds, it was like somebody threw a brown paper airplane across the screen and the person dies with a gigantic slit across their throat and then cuts back to the birds hovering in midair. I mean, the birds were like freaking, the, was like the Flash or Superman or something like that. So you, you see where I'm going with this. It's just, it wasn't even good trash. I love good garbage. But when a movie makes me this critical over sloppily done things, I cannot hold that redeemable at all. I'm sorry, but if, once again, Monkey King with 72 Magic has more redeeming qualities than Birdemic, there is a problem. Oh, and what's worse is there is a Birdemic 2 out. I can't in good taste watch it. God's Not Dead 3 is coming out at, towards the end of March, early April, around Easter time. And I'm actually looking forward to seeing that Christploitation film as opposed to Birdemic 1 or 2. Because at least I know with God's Not Dead, I can make fun of it. I can rip it apart. I, I can point out flaws at least with that and just be like, hey, you're an idiot. But piece by piece, this movie, I cannot... Once again, even if you like trashy films like me or Morgues or some of the new members of uh, The Cheese Horde, it's not worth it. It's free for Amazon Prime members. It's not worth it. Do not put money in James Nguyen's pocket. He's like an even worse poor move or director or producer than Uwe Boll. Or maybe they're on the same caliber. I don't know. I haven't seen a Uwe Boll movie in forever and a day. And one final thing about proving how bad this movie is. Most of my reviews take between 30 to 50 plus takes, depending on how good of a movie it is. This is my fourth take. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I ought to tell you something right there. <sighs> but with that being said, of course, my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion does. So if you've seen this movie, let me know in the comments below. Or if you just want to just put in your input, let me know as well. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on it. Maybe I'm just treating this too much from a cinema snobby kind of point of view. I don't know. I probably am. I could be not. I don't, I don't know. But it's not worth it. And, and you've heard it here first. Um, so with that being said, um, I hope you all have a great weekend. And I'll catch you in the flip side, right? Peace.